You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 247. Today's podcast is brought to you by HitItBoard.com. HitItBoard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with a dog walker A-frame, the HitItBoard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging, they'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hititboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hititboard.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by 1TDC.com. Dog agility can be hard on your dog's body. Help keep their joints and muscles healthy with 1TDC. One tetradecanol complex is a clinically studied blend of unique fatty acid oils that can support your dog's joint health. 1TDC promotes a healthy inflammatory response from head to tail. All of our listeners will automatically qualify for a great 1TDC special offer by purchasing online at BDA1TDC.com. That's BDA, the number one, TDC.com. Today, we're joined by a very special podcast guest. We have Greg Darrett joining us uh, to talk about the new program, At Home Agility by Review, that is being run through UKI Agility International. Welcome to the podcast, Greg. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. And um, let's hope we have a good discussion today. All right. Uh, well, for anybody who doesn't uh, uh, know, um, Greg is the creator of uh, UKA and UKI, two uh, agility organizations, one based in the UK, UKA, right? I've got That's that right. Correct, right? Yeah. All right. And UKI, which is uh, not based in the UK. <laughs> so okay. one of the first things that I wanted to clarify um, was, uh, you know, let's let's take one step back from this new program, this at home agility, and talk about uh, UKI. UKI is an organization I'm familiar with because we have trials in the United States, and I know that there are also trials in Canada. Um, are there other places in the world that that uh, hold UKI trials, or are those the two primary lo- locations at this point? Um, yeah, the US and Canada are, are the main places, but Singapore, we've got a few trials there, and we've got one or two just now starting in Australia. Um, so we, we begin to expand. I mean, the, the, the main the main idea behind UKI was to bring the UKI UKA sorry um, ideas across to America, North America. Um, we had lots of people ask us to do that, so that's really the bulk of where we've got the trials. But um, other countries are beginning to ask us some questions. Singapore has been going probably five years now. I think Australia, about the last year, has been talking about um, having some, and they've got two they've had so far. All right. So, so this organization, UKI, has just announced a program for at-home agility trials. And the idea here is that competitors can um, actually enter a trial, get maps uh, emailed to them, set them up in their own backyard, and run them for, um, for actual qualifying, for, you know, for getting cues towards titles and buys towards events. Um, and there's some really interesting things being done because, uh, you know, there's accounting for space. So uh, there is a 30 by 30 option, a 30. So that would be 30 feet, right? Everything here is in feet. Yeah, everything's in feet, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Difficult for my English brain, but um, yeah, we've, we've done it all in feet for, for the North Americans. Um, all right. So yeah convert all that so if if, uh, if I convert to metric during our conversation I apologize I'll try and stick to the uh, feet <laughs> <laughs> right right exactly so um, this this trial is being run this upcoming wait week um, April 3rd through April 9th is the time that people have to set this up so uh, tell us a little bit about the idea behind um, at home video agility. Okay, well, obviously, with the, the current COVID situ- situation, we um, we get lots of cancellations worldwide. I think we've lost about 150 events so far, um, and that's just getting through to around the 1st of May. So it's been quite a dramatic change of circumstances. So we got quite a few issues going on. Um, obviously, for us, we we wanted to... Um, we, well, we need to try and create some income. We've pretty much gone from 
to a zero percent income for the, all our businesses. Um, and we've got five members of staff we need to look after. Um, so first thing was, how can we create some income just to, to sustain the businesses through this time? But secondly, and, and uh, is keep people's interest in agility and also give them something to do during this self-isolation. We've got lots of people straight away who are asking us, well, what can we do? Can we do anything? So, you know, we sort of put the idea together pretty quickly, if we're, we're honest. Um, I was actually in North America last week, um, I sort of stuck out there for 10 days, and Laura was at home. So two of us had to communicate um, sort of electronically um, through different time differences, and we came up with the idea, of, let's try this. Uh, people at their own house can, can set something up, keep their interest, um, and also basically try and raise us some income if we're being really blunt so that we can pay the costs that we've got for and keep our staff employed. Um, obviously, this last for three weeks is not such a problem, but I think most predictions now look like it's going to be lasting several months. Um, and uh, we certainly don't want to lay any of our guys off. We want to try and keep keep the business together and keep it established where we can. Right. Um, and. And, you know, we've seen lots of things uh, on the internet, that, lots of uh, training ideas, lots of things that you can do at home, lots of challenges that people are putting out, uh, all different ways that we can all stay engaged in agility, but also um, keep the community together, right? And have that community aspect. And And we've been doing uh, ourselves some Facebook Lives, but um, this is a... a um, an idea that's very similar to that, but also has some of the structure of a trial with some of the rewards of a trial. And I think that um, a lot of people enjoy that extra motivation uh, of being able to earn cues. And so let's talk about um, how uh, this works in terms of actually getting uh, points towards your titles. Um, and so my understanding here is that there's no, for this particular um, thing that is, is coming together uh, and we're kind of learning as we go, there's no levels in this particular stay-at-home trial. So everybody's running the same thing, but a clean run can earn you points towards whatever title you happen to be working on in UKI. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I mean, we, we've released this first trial, trial one, and how we develop it over the next couple of weeks or even months, we're, um, we're, we're not quite sure at the moment, but what we've done for this initial trial is it's just, just one course for all levels. Uh, they're quite difficult. Um, we have now run all the, all the trials ourselves, every single class, so the 30, 30, 50, 50, 50 80, 80, it's 22 different courses. Um, we've run them and filmed our dogs doing them just to just to just show examples of what the video needs to look like for one, but also just to actually see how achievable they are. Um, and running to film them is put a little bit of extra pressure on. So, uh, to, you know, try and get clear straight away. Um, and I can say they're not easy by any means to, to put out clear rounds straight away. So the progression points we're offering, obviously we can't, you know, at a normal trial, you turn up, you get one run and you're in front of everybody. So, you can't really practice cheat, or if you want to call that, um, obviously at home we can send the course map out, and even if we ask people to submit within 10 minutes, they're still going to be able to practice. So we create them at a level that hopefully, if they have got the skills to get around these, they do really deserve their progression points. Um, but we've also halved the points, so a normal clear round at UKI would give you four points in your level. This will only give you two points. Uh, for each clear round so it's kind of reduced it but also I think anyone getting around these courses is probably demonstrating skills higher than most trials they'll be doing uh, right. for my personal opinion um, I certainly haven't got my um, dogs around them first time in every single course uh, and that's including you know my dog that's international level dog so she's not got through them every you know first time um, I'm also running my youngster who's just turned two um, who's in the low, lowest levels of British Kennel Club at the moment. She's not yet progressed. Um, so she's also running them to show that, you know, we wanted to show an experienced dog can do them, but also a young dog can do them. Um, and again, it's it's I think it's actually going to do her a lot of good. And what we're hoping people do with their dogs is they're going to go out, train skills they might not have got yet, actually reward the dogs 
which again increases the standard of agility um, as they actually have to do more difficult challenges to actually get their level points. Um, right. Also, you know, when you when you film with that clear range, it's keeping you under competition pressure, pretty much, in my opinion. You know, you you you've got to get it right that time. It's not like you can cut and paste your videos together. Um, so again, keeping people, you know, practiced into that com competition skills was something that we also wanted to offer a little bit more pressure than just you know a bit of fun training. We want to give people the, the fun of the competition as well uh, and the buzz that that gives people in a time where they're sitting in a house and you know getting very very bored from you know if you're looking at Facebook there's a lot of people that are very very bored and you know kind of getting depressed in the situation we're in so hopefully it gives them a little bit of excitement and an adrenaline kick as they go out and try to, to put out that clear round when it counts. Right. Yeah, let me take a step back and say that one of the worst kept secrets in agility something that a lot of people don't really talk about is the competitive nature of the sport um, certainly we all understand that dog agility is a hobby, and now we understand very well that it is a non-essential hobby since the sport has been shut down everywhere in the world. So certainly we understand that it's a hobby, but it is also a sport. It's a competitive sport, and that brings out the competitive nature in people, and agility competitors are, in fact, competitors, right? And so in any kind of competition, the idea that there is a standard against which you can work is what separates practice from, uh, you know, competition from the actual performance. So right now, there's been a big explosion in online courses being offered, uh, training, uh, people, instructors are doing great things, in my opinion, by putting up, uh, you know, free videos of the work that they're doing and people can follow along. But the thing that all, all of those things are missing, every single one of those things is missing is the competitive aspect of dog agility. And um, whether you as a competitor want to believe that or not, it's that competitive nature uh, that is at the, that essence that is at the core of our sport, right? Otherwise we wouldn't have trials. We wouldn't have big events like nationals. We wouldn't have, uh, champions. There would be no need for that. You could teach your dog all of agility, assuming you had all of the equipment and space in your own backyard, and, and that would be it. You know, and uh, you could uh, you could do your own thing. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That you know, trials are the competition, and um, that there, there is a there's a element of that that you need to practice. I think to keep in regular the, the regular skills of being able to compete. Um, so I think that's one thing. Hopefully, you can add, but also. You know, there's that that buzz, that adrenaline buzz that, you know, when you don't compete for a while, you, you miss. And that's why if we take the winter off, we're, we're keen to get back in the spring to compete because of that. You don't get that buzz anywhere else in your life, maybe if you're a competitor. Um, now, some people are more competitive than others. Um, uh, and but, but I definitely think that it's, it's a massively important point that, that, that the competition is, it's more than the training. The training is what you do at home and the comp competition is another element to the sport of participating in right right i mean that's also a very very good point because we don't know when we're going to get back to trials right so if you're a competitor uh even someone who does it professionally you compete at a very high level national level uh or international level you, you know you, you kind of have that strategy of okay well you know maybe we're on a little vacation now we'll take a break for a couple of weeks and then i'm going to make sure that we keep our skills sharp in practice and training so that when trials do open up you know, we can kind of um, get back to it. But now let's say that you're not a professional, right? And you have another job, you have uh, financial concerns and things like that. Or when trials start opening up, maybe it's not 100% safe to go back out. Maybe, uh, maybe we have a vaccine for the virus, things are better, but maybe the vaccine is not widely available yet. You know, and just because agility trials open up, it might be maybe six months or a year later. And now you've been out of the sport two or three years and your dog that was five or six years old is now maybe um, too old. You know, there, there comes this uh, decision making process everyone's going to have to go through. Right. Do I do I get another dog? What do I do? How do I spend my time? How do I spend my money? And there's nothing to bridge that gap is what I'm trying to say, right? We're in this great period of unknown. We have all this uncertainty. There's nothing to bridge the gap. And so I see um, this program as potentially feeling that 
need, right? That so many people are feeling, you know, we, we, we're seeing it even now that people under against advisement, I should say against the advisement of public health officials want to go out and trial right here in America, the AKC has not canceled trials very far in advance. Across the, they haven't canceled them across the board. Right, They've left right. it up to each individual club. Right. And so uh, obviously there, there's many different reasons that they might be doing that. Um, you know, that's a discussion for another time, but one part of that equation is the, the desire from competitors, you know, to get out there and keep competing. And that's where I think this could uh, fill a need. But my concern as a physician would be, are we going to do this in a safe way? Right. right. So that, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Right. Yeah. When when uh, we were first looking at this um, program, um, uh, one of us, Stevans, as a physician, one of his first uh, responses was, you know, he was worried. He was a little worried about uh, uh, what this might um, encourage in competitor behavior. And I wanted to take just a, a kind of a bigger step back and and say anything that you anything that you put together, right? Anything that an organization does, there's a series of decisions and there's pros and cons to each of them and they all uh, kind of come together and uh, some people benefit and some people don't. And that goes for, uh, forget about the situation we're in now, just, you know, UKI in general, you know, um, are, do you have access to trials in your area uh, and things like that? And this is no different, but it's very clear that y'all have looked through and, um, really tried to think about the implications of what you're doing, how people might use it, and um, put as much rules and regulations in place as possible. So uh, one thing that comes out very, very clearly in everything that you and Laura post um, for UKI is the desire that people are safe, and not just safe, that they are following the recommendations of their local government. So tell us about how you're doing that and kind of your personal view on the situation we're in and what people need to be doing. Yeah, we, we, we kind of, this is probably the quickest thing we've ever put out um, with, although we put a lot of thought into it, you know, most of our ideas, you spend a couple of months throwing them back and forward before you actually release it to the general public to give you feedback. So this has come out extremely quickly. So. We called it at home agility uh, um, straight off the back, um, hoping that that would make it obvious what we were intended it for. Um, that obviously we sort of got the, the premiums out and straight away it was clear that perhaps we needed to make it clearer that at home agility was for at home. Um, so we, we, we've upped the rules. So we, we put it in there that, you know, we don't want anybody going out in groups. We don't want anybody going to other training facilities. The idea of this is that if you've got your own facilities, you know, your own space in the back garden that's 30 by 30, or you've got a bigger yard, or you actually have your own building you go into, then you can participate. Now, that is unfortunate for people that haven't got that, and we're really sorry, but, you know, we can only provide a service for people at the moment that actually have access to agility equipment, and that's what our business does. We provide a service that allows people to run agility. So people that don't have access to that, unfortunately, we, we can't cater for you at the moment um, like we, we want to. Um, so, you know, that, that's the idea behind it. It's for you to do on your own, self-isolating, giving you something to do, keeping the sport. So the premium we updated after 24 hours straight away because we put in there, you must follow your local government um, mandates and federal government. Now, I think without getting into politics, I'm big hearing that the, the US is behind in a few states, they're not shut down completely yet. Um, we're obviously in Europe where we're completely locked down. You know, everybody's on lockdown and everybody is pretty much complying um, with that. You know, you're not hearing really, you're getting the odd story on, on the news about one person in one city being arrested by the police, but it's it's pretty much the, the country here is shut down and most of Europe is shut down. So. When we put it out, we thought that you know, we were covering us, covering the rules with that. So, but we have now made that more explicit by just saying, you know, you cannot use a facility of somebody else. So, if you're seen, you you have to state on your video, it's my field, my home, my building. And if someone else is using that facility, then we won't accept their video. 
So you can't have your friend come round to your house to, to, to run. It's that's not acceptable, and we won't accept those those videos in. So um, we've clarified that more in premium um, to try and make that really clear that this is at home. We want nobody put at risk. We don't want anybody, you know, two points for a clear round is not worth getting COD ID. So it's just you know it's that that's the idea, and we, we really want everyone to stay safe and. This is, this is for people to try and give them something to do when they're on self-isolation and keep them in the sport, as Espan just mentioned about, you know, keep that competitive spirit we've all got, people that do compete, that it's allowing you to actually, you know, express that competitive spirit and have some fun and agility. Right. And, and I, I'm, I know, I'm sure that there are people that um, have never had access to a real UKI trial, right, where they live. Uh, There is no UKI in their area. And if they have a field now, that's no longer a barrier. So, you know, there's, there's some group of people where the, the normal, you know, before the world went crazy rules kept them out of UKI, right? Because of where, because of geography, because of where they live. And now, you know, there's some number of those people will now have access to it if they have space. And there's, people who have had access to UKI that now are not going to have access to this program because they don't have their own field. Uh, and again, that's just the nature of every, um, every decision that's made is going to be beneficial to some people, not beneficial to others. And it's uh, about the idea of what can we do for the greatest number of people. And I think y'all have done some really interesting things. One of them we've touched on it, but haven't said it explicitly is this idea of space. So there's actually three different trials. There's uh, one that's a 30 by 30 space. That is really small, right? That's Oh really yeah. Small. Yeah. It's very, very small. It, <laughs> It's the tightest agility I've run in several years. Yeah. Took me back, back to the 90s. Like, what's our yard? <laughs> oh, like, I mean, like, our yard, we can we can definitely do the 30 by 30 and the 50 by 50. We can't quite oh, do okay. 80 so by 80. 30 by 30 we, is even smaller than our yard. Oh, like our, the small space exercises that we've been doing on our Facebook Lives the last two weeks were 50 by 50. Oh, right. And they were like oh. a, a tunnel and four jumps and gotcha. it was a 50 by 50 space. Okay. So okay. 30 by 30 is incredibly small. Yeah. And there's, you yeah. have agility and speed stakes and snooker, you know, courses. I'm yeah. actually, I think that that's going to be extremely interesting to see what you've done from a course design standpoint right. to get these in. I'm insanely curious and I'm entering my dog in, in uh, every single class that you have in the, just, just to see that. So I think it's going to be really interesting. And that, that, brings in, you know, you are trying to be as inclusive as possible. Who would have thought that you could run a trial in a 30 by 30 space, right? Let's give credit. <laughs> to yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the, one of the reasons we wanted to film our own dogs is, you know, obviously a 30 by 30 space and trying to call it an agility class. And we've used an A-frame for this week um, and tried to do three A-frames in that course. So they still do the three contacts. Um, we've tried to keep a weave in of only six pole weave in the 30 by 30. So we've tried to design stuff where you've actually still got the basis to call it an agility class or a jumping class. But also we try to keep the, the distances legal as as best of our ability so that the dog's path is still 16 foot plus. Um, so we still try to make sure that, you know, there's, it's as safe as it can possibly be, taking into consideration that, you know, most people now want 25 foot spacing, right. 30 by 30, you're not getting that. Right. Um, but we, we, we still try to design stuff where, you know, the approaches to the contacts are safe. Um, the approach to the weave gives you distance to scope on all the jumps is enough for a dog to, to jump sensibly, land properly. Um, if they fail the skill test of turning, we still don't want to kill themselves into a brick wall. Um, so, it's been a challenge, but it's one of the reasons we filmed our own dogs is to say, right, are these really doable? Are they safe? Would we put our own dogs on them? So hopefully by, you know, we've, we have run our own dogs. I've run, you know, from my old 12 year old run at select height through to my two year old dog, who's very fresh and very off her head, I suppose is the best description. Um, and crazy to, to, to see, right. Do these work? Um, are they, are they safe to actually put out there and so that people aren't just, you know, running their dogs on something that's dangerous to get the cue. We made sure that, all right, we feel they are safe. They're decent to do. Yes. They're a different skill than maybe you're going to get the trial because you're running 30 by 30, 
but that they are they are safe and they are they are testing. Um, so we hope we've done that. Um, you know, obviously week one is gonna we're gonna see how many people get a clear round. We're gonna look at feedback from people um, and also we, we you know we get lots of with anything you do in agility you always get lots of opinions coming back in about what suits it for that particular person um, but we get some good ideas on you know a number of tunnels we we really sort of the 30 by 30 we designed with two tunnels and in hindsight that was probably stupid because anyone as only owns 30 by 30 doesn't have two tunnels right but that was something it was something we didn't consider to be honest you know we, we've got a bigger field and we're, we're lucky to have a bigger field um, where we own six tunnels so it just didn't cross my mind not to put two tunnels in and also the initial design we were like well tunnels are safer than jumps in the smaller area perhaps right so and you can you know put them around the walls or the, or the boundary and, and you've got more gives you a bit more room to get the number of obstacles in um, but a very valid point was if you own 30 by 30, you probably don't own two pipe tunnels. Right, um, right. So, you know, design for future weeks, we're going to take it that bit into, into account. We've also right. got people saying about, about different yard sizes, you know, maybe rectangles rather than squares. So I think we might look at that in future weeks, looking at, you know, sort of a 40 by 60 or 50 by 80, um, again, to see whether we can incorporate and see basically see what's most popular. Maybe we'll do different ones each week to try and, you know, people get every two or three weeks, they get an area that fits their space. We'll keep everybody involved or more people involved um, is our plan. But the other thing I just wanted to touch on is, you know, just before we started that, you, you mentioned about some people aren't got access to this. And we're very aware of that. And we're very aware that, you know, some people aren't happy that they've not got access to this. But we're also, once this, this situation calms down, we've already started talking to show managers about putting extra shows on in their areas to make sure that, we can give them extra opportunities once it calms down. Um, and there's certainly two or three trial managers that are definitely going to put on extra shows so they can get their buys towards the open if if the situation stops in time to allow it to happen. So, yes, at the moment we're not catering for those people, but we do have plans to try and make sure that we do extra catering for them when the situation resolves itself. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm just going to put this out there now. I have not seen these courses yet, but I'm going to warn people now something that may surprise people. And that is the amount of memory and uh, mental effort it takes to run a um, mini obstacle course in a small space. Because there's so much, you don't realize how much of your memory Absolutely. is based on um, running around and having things constantly look different <laughs> right, in a course. Mm, and yeah. when you run the same obstacle over and over and over, you get lost easier. This is actually a really good um, exercise for people who struggle memorizing. It's basically overtraining for your memory when you yeah. do a full uh, course in a small uh, space. Absolutely. I don't get lost very often on course. You know, it's one of the um, skills I do have as a competitor. I'm very good at learning courses very quickly and, and remembering them. And 30 by 30, I can say are a challenge. It's the way I, I got lost a couple of times and it's that's pretty rare for me. It's not one of my weaknesses is, is, is remembering. And you'd be like, oh my God, I've been around here three times already. And right. you come out back out of the tunnel and it's like, is it that one jump that we've got or that one A-frame? And it, it, it does it. It is, it's incredibly difficult. I actually think we filmed, it took us much longer to film the 30 by 30s than the 80 by 80s, that's for sure. So, wow, that's that's so funny. Yeah, it's good. I think this is yeah. going to be very interesting. For it's going to get a lot of dogs too, you know? Oh, yeah. It's the toughest part of any course at a big event where the judge takes you through an area twice and the first time they want your dog to throttle, the second time they want the dog to do the backside and you see dogs just like, nope, I'm doing the same yeah. thing we did the first time yeah, I came yeah. through here. Oh, yeah. yeah, like yeah. anti-pattern so training. Gonna, yeah, it's, I think yeah. It, I think that'll be uh, very good because a lot of people don't put that in their training. So this will kind of force them to do that. Um, I, I want Now I want to talk, I, I've got questions about the uh, the open, the UKI open. So let me give you a little bit of background. That's... Um, the I guess the premier event here in the United States is there a Canadian version as well, yes. or do Canadians come down yeah. here? They have their own. Uh, right? They have a Canadian. The open. Canadian Open. They have the Canadian Open. Yeah, the, 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 we we get quite a few Canadians coming down to the US Open, but yeah, they have their own Canadian Open. It's, it, it runs end of August, start of September, varies each year a little bit. But this year, obviously, um, is currently we've no idea where that's going to happen, but it it's scheduled for 
the top of my head and I'm, I haven't got it to hand, but I believe it's the end of August. It's scheduled for this year. And those okay. function yeah. as and basically they, the tryout event for the WAO teams for those two countries, correct? Yes. I mean, they're, they're standalone events and um, I would say not even 50% are trying out. But yes, they, they, they both involve um, the results from the, the events there go towards points to, to win them onto their, their country team. Uh, both countries are slightly different on their selection. But, but both um, both are point scoring events for their for their triads, yeah. Okay, and then here in the United States, the Open is typically held when? Like, wh- uh, what was so it? We, we've we've tried to stick to the second Sunday in November, so that's okay. our okay. Always been our goal, and unfortunately today we've had to um, announce a change of date due to the WO having to postpone from May. Um, gotcha. So that's caused a little bit of a change of schedule. We've, um, if we're in one of those situations where there are very little options to um, to move big events around, and you know these these big equestrian centres that we use for the big events, they're also in you know quite a lot of danger really for um, you know shutting down and losing the business. They're obviously right. gone from right. being you know this time of year these these big equestrian centres are starting to you know to, to build up for their big events, and suddenly they've lost all their income as well. So they're trying to rearrange every event to later in the year and taking their calendars in October. So there's very little room for manoeuvre. So the WO was offered the last weekend in October, which means it finishes on November the 1st, which means my team, we're going to have to I bring out about 15 people from England to help run the US Open. So they were also all helped me at WO. So those guys were basically going to have to travel home Monday morning to England, um, unload all the WO kit that comes back to England, then jump on a plane Tuesday morning to arrive in in Jacksonville probably late Tuesday night to be available to work Wednesday morning when the Open's due to start Thursday. And it, was, it just became, you know, it's just impossible. There's no way that physically those guys can run two events back to back, including myself. You know, maybe when I was 25, I could have considered running them back to back, but now there's no way I'm running those two events back to back. We won't play. <laughs> Yeah, now that you're 29, back. you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, breaking 30 next year. So, um, yeah, we talk about, you know, the, the ring managers and myself. We Physically, we do about 30 miles a day. So to try and do that for 15 days straight, is, uh, as well as the mental pressure of working 18-hour days and dealing with that stuff is just not going to happen. But but more realistically, that you know, we need to set up the US Open. We get there Monday morning to set up. If we're not arriving to Wednesday morning, we're just not going to be ready. So that obviously was one of the, the big problems we had with the WO. It was a, a decision on do we cancel or do we postpone? Um, some of the complex, complexness of, of cancelling that was that you've got people from 40, 42 countries that come in this year that spent the last 15 months trying to qualify mm-hmm. and have qualified. And so just then take that away from them. Um, when they've already actually earned their place. Um, but also one of the, the the more difficult decisions, the financial decision for them, you know, a lot of these countries have booked flights. Well, airlines are happy to postpone the flight, but they're not happy to give you a refund. So if we cancelled WO and said, right, next year, you know, those people would lose all their money. The hotels aren't also refunded. They're allowing people to postpone. Um, so again, you would lose all that money that you give to hotels. And also uniforms, there's a huge cost and all the 2020 team kits are paid for by now. So we didn't want to cancel for that reason, really. For one, we wanted those people that qualify to actually be able to run, to represent their country. It might be the only time they achieve that. Um, and also, we didn't want to make people lose literally thousands of dollars of, of money, you know, from all the teams that come in from North America to Japan to Australia, New Zealand, you know, all these guys, South Africa, they've all spent a lot of money on flights and hotels. So we really want to make sure that they can you know, use that money they've spent, so to speak. So the decision was definitely to move, and that then meant we had to move the US Open, um, and the only available date they really had that was going to work in the 2020 calendar was going to be the following weekend. So we are running pretty much crazy back-to-back. We, you know, we do our three days off traveling to North America pretty much, but um, that, that, that's the decision we've gone with to try and, again, make to, to cater for as many people as possible. I mean, if 
corona carries on maybe that none of the events will happen in october november but hopefully by then you know we will be able to open up we will be able to compete and we will be able to offer everybody or as many people as possible the the, the opportunity to compete at events that they want to um because they'll be preparing to go by then hopefully yeah and i think this is a very interesting kind of look behind the scenes from the organizational uh, viewpoint right if i'm looking at this from say uh strictly a public health a you know physician viewpoint i'm like shut it all down cancel everything like why are we why are we going for postponement instead of cancellation even the american kennel club has only postponed the national agility championship which was held it's supposed to be going on right now this weekend right now in georgia (laughs) you know when they made the decision to postpone there were just a couple of cases in georgia and no one had died of course today there are thousands and thousands of cases uh, dozens Mm -hmm. and dozens of deaths in the Georgia area, that state uh, specifically is not doing very well among the leaders uh, behind New York, California, Washington, Louisiana here, uh, worse there in Georgia than it is here in Texas. Um, So it it was definitely good that they did not go forward with the event, um, certainly, but now we can kind of um, see from the organizational viewpoint that there's uh, so much, there's such an interrelatedness Two things, right? Facilities, airlines, hotels. There, are, anytime you put on an agility trial, there's so many different industries that come together to provide yeah. you an event where you, you know, you drive with your dog in a car or, or, or fly or something, and you go and you compete somewhere in agility. There's a lot of things that intersect here, and it's really hard to coordinate these things, especially the, the for the bigger events that we're talking about. And what Greg, I think, has given you. And, you know, I'm a little more, I'm a little softer on this now than I was, say, maybe two weeks ago, um, is the perspective that you got uh, for the Olympics. So, you know, Japan was supposed to host the Olympics. That's this summer. It is not going to happen. It has been officially postponed to, I think, 2021. And um, even that, in my estimation, is uh, optimistic, right? Given that a vaccine is unlikely to be produced before 2021. Um, But... That that's that same issue, right? Why are we not just canceling the Olympics, right? Yeah. And a lot of people like to focus on just the athletes, right? And certainly that is fair. A lot, these athletes, the Olympics happen every four years, for those of you who don't know. And so literally people train not just for one year. You know, in, in Dog Agility, we do it for one year, but really mm-hmm. this is four years. Can you imagine if nationals, your big event, whatever it is, cross nationals, world championship was only every four years? right? How perfect the cycle would have to be for the age of your, your dog, right? And the same thing happens in human athletics. Humans are, generally speaking, not out there competing in the Olympics in their 40s and 50s, right? There's a very limited window where they're in peak condition to perform and compete at that level. And so, um, you know, not only is there that athlete part, but there's also everything that's coming together, right? All the different companies, um, all the all the things we've talked about, you know, airlines, hotels, but local economies, uh, you know, national um, interests in all of the different sports. So one of the first people to um, uh, say that, hey, you know, we shouldn't do this and to push the International Olympic Committee was USA Swimming. And here among all the athletes and sports in the United States, we're very good at swimming. We get a lot of medals. And so that put a lot of pressure on them and say, hey, we're pulling our athletes now, what are all the other sports going to do? Now, the other sports, now, now that they can safely follow suit, right? Because the, the big dog has spoken. And so Canada pulls out their, their people. Uh, and, and, and now there's a cascade and Japan finally relents. They say, okay, hey, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and postpone this year, but we don't want to cancel at this point. But I like how you know that in your mind, you have that flexibility, that understanding that, hey, it may be something that ultimately has to be canceled but we're doing everything in our power to accommodate the competitors who have already invested so much uh, and to kind of follow through on your commitments, even though financially you guys are just, you know, just headed South right now. Um, Another place that this is taking place that a a lot of agility people aren't aware of because here in the United States, agility people are a little bit on the older side. Their kids are, if they have kids are, are grown up. We have children now school age, uh, 
10 year old and a 14 year old. So the 14 year olds in high 15. school, 15, sorry. <laughs> and we have advanced placement exams. So these are basically college level courses that they can take in high school. They take tests for, they, they take courses all year. And then at the end of the year, they take exams for credit. And this is for real college credit. Like these credits have value. They have money. You don't have to be in college as long. You can make sure that you finish in four years. Some people can finish in three, three and a half years. And you know, you're talking about savings of potentially a hundred thousand dollars. And so this is a really big deal. And even the people who administer the AP exams are looking at ways to, maybe we can administer this test online. You know, we are going to have to postpone it. We're going to have to look at other ways to proctor the exam. And now that, of course, that raises issues. How do we ensure that the students aren't cheating and all different kinds of things that they never had to anticipate before, but they are trying to be flexible and, 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 and service their community. So when we think about it that way, AKC, USDA, UKI, everyone out there is, as an organization, you know, they're really here to service the community, right? They provide a service for us. And so they have to balance out these commitments. Uh, now, having said all of that, I, I just do want to make it clear that I firmly believe everything should be shut down right now at this time. <laughs> Um, you know, until we start to see improvement, which we are not seeing where we need to see it, and that would be Europe, UK, United States, and all the other countries in the world where data coming in is not as reliable, where the health infrastructure is not as good, even though those countries do not have uh, dog agility, at least on the scale that we practice it in the United States and UK and, and Europe, we have to look at those countries because they have a tremendous impact on the health and welfare of our countries. Right, and that's what's holding us back from agility. Okay, so I think um, all of that kind of works together, and you know, I, I'm I'm glad that we've been able to kind of look at all the different sides of this, and and my my hope here is that we understand that the decision making is perhaps not as black and white. Ultimately, sure, black and white from a public health perspective, but the behind the scenes of how do we plan for something where there's so much uncertainty? And I think the thing that makes the most yeah. sense if you're a sports organization um, like UKI, like the Olympic Committee, is to do it in a stepwise fashion. Okay, we know for sure, 100%, we can't do this now. When is the next possible time we can do it? Okay, and then we're going to reevaluate at that time. And that's even how the schools are doing it with school closures, right? We're going to shut it down. And then we're going to reevaluate. And then we're going to wait and see what public health officials uh, recommend, what the government is allowing us to do, and make um, staged decisions in that way. And nobody likes the uncertainty. Nobody likes not knowing uh, when these events are going to be and not being able to plan for them. But that's the reality of, of the world right now. And, and I just want all of our listeners to realize that uh, whether it's uh, the U.S. Open, whether it's WAO, whether it's AWC World Championship, whether it's any event uh, in any aspect of your life, be it agility or not, um, everything right now is uh, a guess, right? There, there is nothing, nothing scheduling wise that we can depend on right now. And that's obviously not the fault of the organizations. And so I think uh, we all have to um, accept this uncertainty and uh, view all of these decisions as um, guesses for the future that may have to change. And I think, uh, you know, hearing Greg talk, he's very aware of that, you know, saying, you know, this is the date that we've chosen and we hope, hope <laughs> we can, we can hold it by then. But uh, if it's not safe, you know, it can't happen. Honestly, we're seeing unprecedented restrictions in movement by governments, right? I mean, uh, there's nothing we can do about that. We don't know what the world's going to look like at the end of November and if people would even be allowed to travel internationally. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Well, one of the big things with postponement is that it allows everybody another seven months. But so with WO, for example, the airlines are saying you can book a flight again up to December the 31st because uh -huh. you're canceling your, your May flight. But if they now rebook them for October and we're still locked down in October, they will be able to defer them again for past December 31st. So maybe next May they'll be able to use them. So by postponing and actually stating the date, people can rebook things, which then if we're still locked down, they'll be able to rebook again. Um, so if, if that makes sense, you know, that, that, that we're probably going to, we're 
the problem is everyone wants, a, everyone wants an answer now. And there's lots of people to consult in every decision we make. And um, so, for example, WO, we've managed to find a date in October. So we've, we've put it there now. We've discussions this week with the venue and the, the companies over there. You know, there's, there's lots of companies that bring in seating, toilets, showers, electricity for the camping units, um, internet companies come in. So all these companies are coming in. They've all been paid. So, they, you know, they're not going to refund the money. They want you to postpone and they will transfer to another date. So we've got to come up with another date to actually be able to transfer everything, if that makes right. sense. So, but again, going, you know, we've gone seven months. Well, predictions are that we might be shut down for six months. So, well, you know, we don't know where we're going to be, but we're going to have dates that we're going to try and kick out with all these companies the next two or three weeks to say, right, if we don't know on September the 1st, for example, we're going to postpone. Are you happy with that? And get these guys to agree it. The other thing by moving stuff away is that most companies have a three month or one month cancellation fee, which, you know, if you cancel before, they don't charge you. By moving it that far ahead now, we can start making decisions and actually decide, all right, we're going to cancel this stuff, um, you know, without getting too much detail, but we've probably got about £25,000 worth of higher fee Got, uh, gone out the door for WO at the moment well we can get all that back if we cancel within two months pretty much so if on August the 26th I decide that actually the world isn't changing you know it's going to shut down I can actually cancel everything and not go broke which is you know good for my, good for the business if we're really honest I don't want to go broke I don't want to go bankruptcy and I can claim that money back and those those companies of my contract with them is that they have to refund me if I cancel with that much notice so by postponing that date and actually announcing a date, it puts me back in control of not only you know keeping people safe, but actually making sure that WO doesn't go bankrupt. Um, which you know two weeks ago um, it was looking pretty bleak for WO. You know if I'm really honest. So right. Um, but you know all these companies have been really great. Though I just want to say that these companies have been great. They're all understanding. They're all in the same boat though that they right. can't afford right. to lose the income. So they're kind of we're all on a on a double-edged sword, we're, we're trying to fight to try and to be safe, keep good PR, but also to make sure that actually the company doesn't go broke. Um, so these guys are kind of working with us and we're all trying to work together to make sure that you know, we can all exist, we can all keep our um, our clients safe, um, but ultimately we survive as well. So it's, um, it's a very complex situation, which just as a competitor, will that show happen, yes or no? It's not quite as easy as that, I'm afraid. Um, right. Right. which I'm learning in a lot more detail today. I've had cancellations in the past because of bad weather and things like that, but that's normally been, okay, you can't run this show full stop. There's no option. Whereas obviously this situation is, we don't know where we're going to be. I mean, two days ago, Trump was saying that Easter, we might be opening America back up. I think that's probably hugely optimistic. Um, but the news here was that that's what, you know, the, the American government was saying. I think that's probably not true at all but if that is true and in, in middle of april it this is all over well october is a long way away isn't it but mm-hmm. you know but, but i you know i'm not saying that's gonna i don't can't see any but what i my understanding of the situation is that we're not looking at april may yeah, or june for anything we, have our, at all. we have our own issues between the way yeah. our uh, political leaders are interacting with our public health leaders so it's a, it's a little yeah. problematic there's just a lot of uncertainty and people aren't sure what to say and they're trying to strike a balance between boosting morale and of course uh, saving lives so yeah absolutely you know, they're both important yeah. but um a, a yeah. Yeah. task one of the other issues that we've had here is that our government didn't lock down for a few weeks and lots yeah. of our suppliers and venues were there for saying, you don't need to cancel your show because you don't legally have to. So right. even, yeah. even though morally we wanted to, we still had to work through those contracts and have those discussions, arguments about what to do and what they would concede. And it's not, right. you know, so we were telling people, we're not taking entries for this show, but we're not calling it cancelled. Read between the lines what that means. So we're not taking any entries. So there'll be no competitors at this show, but we can't say the word cancelled because if we do, that supplier or that venue keeps all the money. So it's a it's been quite a political game as well, if that makes sense, of what we've been able to actually say publicly um, on and the reality of you know of people actually looking at what's going on and, and understanding that okay. 
they haven't actually publicly announced something yet, but it's pretty obvious it's not going to happen. And trying to get people to just read between the lines has been quite a difficult, difficult point of view to get across. Right, right. And that's why I'm glad we're doing this podcast. I think we're giving people, I think a lot of people are going to listen to this podcast and learn things that they didn't know, or they're going to see things from a perspective that they didn't quite have. Um, Something related to this, I'm I'm just going to put this out there because I think it applies to all organizations and everyone in every organization. But, um, you know, in agility, we have a qualification structure, right? You got to get certain amount of things to get a title. You got to get certain titles and certain things to go to these uh, big events. So a lot of people are worried about everything that they've invested over the last uh, year, certainly. Uh, Here in America, for example, we have the AKC Invitational. A lot of people have to trial. Some of the breeds is very competitive. They have to trial quite a bit, right? And it's it's quite competitive. And they don't know if that event is even going to be held or if it's going to be delayed, if trials are going to be open in some parts of the country, maybe that's going to give those competitors an advantage. And I think these are very um, real concerns. And I, I would, I, I guess I would advise everyone to be very patient with this because obviously the first thing we have to do is get the, uh, the medical public health situation fixed, solved, under control. But it is my hope and, my, and frankly, my expectation that organizations like AKC, UKI, USDAA, they're going to take all of that into account. Right. So we're going to reach a point and who knows when that point will be. Is it going to be in several months? Is it going to be in a year and a half? Right. We don't know. Um, one end point to look forward to certainly is the development of a vaccine that works and is safe. Um, but they are going to look at that and say, OK, well, we understand for the past five years, our qualifications for the the open for AKC Nationals for Agility World Championship tryouts was this. But we understand that since people haven't been having that access to trial, we're going to change these qualifications. Okay. And we understand yeah. there's a group of people. It's like, um, you know, it's like all those high school kids this year and they're not going to have their graduation and college graduation and their proms and their dances and all, all their things. We understand that, you know, people have um, missed this. This could be a lost year, you know? So maybe, uh, organizations can look at, okay, well, everyone who qualified in 2020 and we didn't hold the event at all, we tried to postpone and then we had to cancel. Maybe all of those people can also come in in 2021, right? But those are conversations to have much further down the line. But I assure you, organizations are going to be aware of that because the last thing organizations want to do is make you mad, right? (laughs) Think about it this way, right? The industry right now is nothing. It's collapsed. Greg is telling you they're tottering on the verge of bankruptcy, okay? (laughs) Literally. Do you think Greg and the AKC, who they're going to be in the same boat, are in a position to say, oh, well, no, we're going to to keep it uh, seven double Qs and, and a million points and make you do all these things, when the reality is people are going to be very slow to go back to the sport. Yes, there's going to be a group of people who are going to jump right back in right away. But remember, uh, especially in the U S and, and UKI being based mostly here in the U S, but even when you look at places like the UK it's very different from Europe, the average age of the competitor is just a little bit older, right? A little bit higher risk category. So even once you get all clear, people are going to be very slow to come back into agility trials. And because of the financial fallout, right? The damage to the economy, they may not be able to afford to go back there. Right. So if you are these organizations, are you really going to keep your things the same? Now, I can't guarantee what they're going to do. I can't guarantee. I can't tell Greg what to do. I can't tell the AKC what to do. But if everybody just calms down and thinks about it for a moment. Right. Again, they are they are they are the 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 pillars of our sport. Right. And they're going to do everything they can, not just to keep people in it but to bring the people back in a way that makes sense. To rebuild. Once it's safe, because I I strongly feel this, dog agility has collapsed and it is going to have to be rebuilt. And that's why I was so intrigued when I heard about what you were doing with UKI, Greg, because it is a way to, um, in in a way, mitigate some of the damage to the agility industry and uh, yeah. kind of the psyche, I think, of the, of the competitor. Just the idea that different people, not just here, but will be able to uh, do this online and get that competitive aspect back. 
stay sharp, get that adrenaline rush that you're talking about, have courses provided to them so they don't have to go fish for them themselves or design it for themselves. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's doing something for our community. And for that, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative. Thank you. I mean, yeah. go on. Uh, I was going to say, one of, one of the examples we've got with this kind of situation was in England in going back now, 2001, we had the foot and mouth um, disaster where agility was shut down for over six months here. And they reckon around 30% of people never came back to agility. So, you know, it's a third of competitors stopped because they, they took that much time out of the sport. And when the crisis was over, they decided, or they'd found other things to do, decided they didn't want to go back into the, the life of dog agility. So that, that's obviously um, a, a concern for the sport that if, you know, just nationally, we lose 30% again of the competitors, that's a huge hole in the sport to um, try and come back from. So we're foot and mouth is slightly different because it was only activities in fields that was shut down. Um, oh. So people found other activities they could go and play, you know, soccer or uh, badminton, or they could go and do other sports. Whereas, you know, but so it's a slightly different situation, but I think we will lose a percentage of competitors will realize, actually, I don't want to go back to agility. You know, they'll, they'll take their time out and they will decide that, no, I'm not going back to the sport and we will lose some, you know, some low level people through to middle level people through to some probably some top level people that you know that the sport will lose out from from people that are actually driving the sport forward with their, their instruction and their their ideas so um i think that's quite a concern that we also need to try and address through this time is to keep people interested to keep them wanting to um, participate in agility so that we don't lose people that are going to actually be beneficial to the sport long term Right. Yeah. It's a real cautionary tale. And, 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 uh, Stefan, I totally agree with you. We are going to lose a percentage of people and, uh, we want to, um, mitigate that and keep that percentage as low as we can. I think that, uh, in 2020, the agility community is a lot more connected than it was in 2001 in terms of, yes. uh, you know, the advent of, of how, um, internet savvy or the population has become and how connected across uh, geography it has become um, with everything mm. online. And so I hope that that also uh, plays a part in this. And, and, and we're seeing it already, right? We're seeing people coming together online uh, and um, keeping up their skills and their motivation and their excitement. And, and this program is another way to do that. Um, I think uh, one of the other things, uh, kind of looking at how you've structured this, um, that I wouldn't have thought of, at, at least I didn't think of until I read the premium, was this idea of um, safety of the dog and overwork of, of the dog because you have something where you can run it over and over and over until you get it right, that there's a concern for the dog's well-being. And, and um, so tell us a little bit about what you put in place to um, to ensure that we're also taking care of our dog athletes. Yeah, so uh, that was something we didn't want to do. We didn't want people to be drilling the dog around the course 10 times and then film the 11th, uh, the 11th sort of go, um, not only for the sort of, to try and keep it a little bit of a level playing field, um, but also obviously that welfare side of, we don't want dogs being drilled that hard. So we, we added that you have to film 10 seconds before and 10 seconds after. Um, it's also helped us be true a couple of, couple of courses that you know I've struggled with the 30 by 30s with, with my youngster and after two goes I'm like okay she needs a break and I'm going to film the same so now she's going to get we'll come back out and try this later so it's 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 that's hopefully what we're going to do with people is that they know they can't have a dog that's looking exhaustive at the start or finish of the run because then we're just not going to judge it you know the dog looks like it's been working for half an hour and you're filming that clear round we're going to say that's unacceptable and um, don't you know don't submit that so hopefully people keep that in mind when they are out there training and then running for the clear is that you've still got to have a fresh dog um and we still don't want you to be you know, we want you to be being a decent proactive dog trainer here um and treating your dog as the athlete that should be treated and, and, and not worked to try and drill it around the course so that on its 10th go it will actually get a clear round um so and yeah the we'll have a sure. whole week to to um, set this up and and run it. It with the I guess the one caveat that um, the way to get a buy for the U.S. Open is to 
set it up and run it on day one and two of the trial, correct? Yeah, correct. So um, the US Open criteria for the pre the virus was uh, certain five day rounds in agility, five in jumping, uh, some games and some speed stakes. Um, but one of those had to be a double Q. So anyone that wants to get a double Q, we're going to try and keep that in place so that you have to get that on day one. Um, so your agility round and your jumping round need to be submitted on day one. So again, by bringing in that rule that if your dog looks like it's exhausted, you know, if you've been drilling the jumping course 10 times, agility course 10 times, we're not going to give you that double Q. You know, we want you to be going out and actually showing you can do a double Q pretty much off the back so that you get that, that score. Right. So um, it's, it's an interesting balance. I really enjoyed hearing you talk about how you guys struggled to run these courses. I think that uh, when people just read the premiums, there was a sense that uh, maybe this is um, an unfair advantage to people who are able to do this now, that it's somehow easier yeah. to get this double Q on the agility at home than it would be to get this double Q out in the real world. And uh, hearing you talk about it, I think there's oh, this balance see, where these courses are kind of so much harder and different from what we see out there that you are still demonstrating the same level of capability under this program that you would be under that program. It's just very different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's different, but you know what? Anyone that gets a gets a two point cue on any of these, I think, deserves it. And I think they probably got a dog demonstrating a higher level of skill than they would have been demonstrated at a trial, in my own opinion. Um, you're not saying these are impossible; they're they're all doable. And like I said my two year old's got around all of them. Um, but you know, I, I don't think I, I hope that, that criticism will will disappear straight away after the first trial. People will actually realise that oh, okay, it's not the case of paying my entry fee and I've, I've ended up with, you know, eight clear rounds, eight cues. I don't think that's going to happen. I think anyone that manages to get eight cues in seven days is probably got a very well-trained dog. It might be that <laughs> I, can deserves to get I cannot them. wait. <laughs> it's, it's, we, we filmed, we filmed them. We've, we've got them all done today. Today was our last day filming. Um, so we've taken four days to film them, um, but we have used um, five dogs to film them. Wow. So we we filmed all three trials, but if you work on that percentages, not one dog would have got through a whole trial in 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 the time. So um, yeah, I, I, you know anyone that puts that criticism forward that these have been easy cues and easy buys, yeah, I think they'll be changing the tune once actually see the results <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and um, actually see the courses that they actually got to do. So um, yeah, one, this one thing. Go on. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I said well, one thing. We're also. Um, we're looking at doing is uh, not for this trial, but future trials. Um, it's four legged flicks have approached us, um, and maybe we're going to try and look at streaming them instead. So, we're going to look at a, an alternative oh. way for week two because obviously, four legged flicks are not in the best position as they make you know, their living is their business runs on filming people at trial, yeah. which right? Got yeah. to zero percent, and obviously, today they are due to be AKC, so they obviously in, in a in a serious situation, same as us. So we get on well with four-legged flicks. I mean, they're the greatest company ever. And Chris is just a brilliant guy. So absolutely, it, yes. You know, we we've been chatting to Chris and what we can do to help him and what he can do to help us. So we're looking at maybe trial two is that we'll come up with a way that everybody's run can be streamed. So that, um, and then people can watch at home with their self isolation. They get to actually watch sort of a real life trial happening um, and hopefully can help four-legged flicks as well out if they if they're in a position to do so. Um, for, for the streaming so it's pretty much like you would have done normally at a show he's going to try and uh, stream the virtual trials as well so that's something we're work, working on for week two you know to, to help one of our one of our good guys that's really helped UKI and WO over the last three or four years you know Chris has been an integral part of those events growing um, and so hopefully that will also bring another another sort of realm to it where people get to be viewed by anyone around the world because it'll be on YouTube um, mm -hmm. That's something we've been discussing the last 48 hours. So again, um, hopefully yeah. that's something we can, we can bring through to. So again, interesting. A bit more pressure on people to run, but also let other people see, you know, okay, these cues aren't easy. These people right. aren't cheating, getting their free cues and progressing. They're actually, you know, you'll watch the runs, hope to say, oh, well, fair play. That person deserves to get two points today because that's a really good run. So that's, right. that's yeah. what we're seeing. Um, I said as well, you know, 
one of the things UKI we want to do with, with UK, UKI, WO is increase the level of the sport in the world or in the country. Um, and I actually think by, you know, I'm just taking my youngster here, she's two years old and if she's going to do these trials the next six weeks at home, let's say, on the, where I say six weeks, I think her skills are going to improve dramatically. Certainly working the 30 by 30 is going to make her, you know, think about different things. Uh, the 80 by 80 is going to then challenge her differently again. So just by running them with my own dogs, I think they're both going to improve dramatically with the skills that they're going to have to achieve. Um, and get used to me working under pressure. Filming a dog is is a lot different to, um, you know, um, anything else. It takes about four days of filming the DVDs, you know, one take, two take, three takes, and you start to get really frustrated. So it's, <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's um, I've had quite a few deja vu moments the last couple of days, just about when you put a camera on you and the difference that makes. So hopefully, again, that's going to pass across to people that they've got a camera on them, puts a bit more pressure, um, and again, makes makes it harder to throw out that clear round, and therefore this, the queue isn't as easy as when you're maybe at a trial where nobody's watching and nobody's really interested, you know? So Right. And, and I'm excited to hear you say, like, in week two, because uh, uh, you've put out um, the premium for the week one, so uh, clearly there are thoughts of, of continuing to provide this uh, as a possibility. And I know that you'll be learning along the way and people should mm -hmm. uh, definitely read the premium every single week because I expect there, there could be changes uh, that people need to be aware of. Um, but um, I, I think that can be really exciting for a lot of people. I think there's also a group of dogs. Uh, I think it's a small minority, but this can be really exciting for a group of dogs that maybe have um, some anxieties that prevent them from competing in uh, a normal type of event. You know, maybe they, maybe yeah. they throw up every time you put them in a car, <laughs> right? Yep. And, yeah, uh, and they have brilliant skills and you do stuff in the backyard and you love them and they, you um, enjoy working them, but you've never gotten to do much outside in the real world. And having this as um, a venue to uh, kind of strut your stuff a little bit, I, I think could be really exciting for a lot of uh, handlers. Yeah. 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 We, we've definitely had people already um, message us and, and post on the Facebook pages about, oh my God, my dog can actually do agility at a trial. It's the first time I'd ever be able to do that because it's got phobia of something at a trial or it's got an aggressive issue where it can't go into a trial environment, you know, which, okay, that's, that's, we're not bringing aggressive dogs into a trial environment, but also that dog now is going to, going to get something maybe more for its life and maybe help focus it better and therefore maybe resolve that issue it's having by actually now having something to achieve and the, you know, the, the human dog bond is going to grow stronger with that relationship because they're now at home working together um, you know let's hope there's a positive there as well for some of the dogs out there that that, that, that situation applies to yeah i also think about bar knockers yeah i've had a couple of bar knockers in my day and then if you get multiple chances before you submit your video that's why i also like your uh 10 seconds before, 10 seconds after. So you don't run them into the ground. You know, you're going to have to spread out those attempts. But, and yeah. even though that'll be frustrating, it's, um, I think, uh, generally it's just going to reduce your costs. You know, the, yeah. you have so many attempts when you go out there in trials and your dog's always knocking one bar, one bar, two bars, one bar. Yeah. You know, those, those really vicious bar knockers. I think that's another group of people that might really uh, enjoy this or get a lot of benefit, view their dog differently. Right. So, you know, sometimes you can develop a really bad attitude toward your bar knocking dog. And here mm -hmm. this kind of, you know, gives you all the benefit of the trial, but without, um, uh, without the horrible pain and, and damage to the relationship that some people put on their dogs when that happens. So, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, saying what, one of the things we hope it's going to do is, is actually make people dog train a bit better. You know, I mean, how many times you go to trial, you make the mistake, you then drive home, you never actually fix that mistake. Well, here you can run that trial, make that mistake, and maybe you'll then spend the next day dog training, fix it, and then on day three, you can actually, that skill's taught, and then you film it and you get your cue. So I, I think we can hopefully increase some standard of the sport by with this a little bit maybe, because people are actually going to practice skills that maybe they would just gone home and forgot to fix. Now they've actually, it's set up, try it again, fix it, reward your dog. You don't need to film it, just just sequence two to three or whatever it is. Let's say you missed yeah. that weave entry. Well, spend spend two days training that weave entry. Now run the course and you get it on day four. Try it again, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Uh, now now you've actually improved that dog. Whereas miss it, miss that weave entry at the trial. Go home, say I oh, missed my weave entry, but never set it back up and fix it. 
this one is already set up for you in your backyard, you know, just set up for your home to train it. So That's a great I'm, point. I'm, yeah, I'm hopeful that, you know, we're, one of the things we want to do, I mean, my, you know, I, I've grown up in sport, the sports give me a lot. I would, I would like the sport to improve, you know, I'd like the sport to keep going better, you know, as, as much as it's my living agility, it's also my passion and I'm hoping that we can, you know, these can improve the standard of sport so we get the sport better and better and, and it, it grows in, in that. So hopefully, you know, there, there might be a, you know, a silver lining to this kind of thing that we can actually see a lot of people increase their dog's ability and skills. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, there were a couple of things that I just wanted to clarify um, uh, for people who are maybe less familiar with UKI or um, just in this program specifically. So uh, people, like if you have the space, you could, and now we know these are very hard, so um, it, it might be hard to run all of these, but you could enter the 30 by 30 and the 50 by 50 and the 80 by 80. I mean, depending on what space you have, you can enter all of those if you want, correct? Yeah, yeah. If, if you've, you know, if, you, if you've got, if you've got a dog that can do, it's, it's 20, that's twenty two classes. But you know, I mean, average show we're doing what three or four runs a day, maybe five runs a day. So you, you could argue that in a seven day trial, that's 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 easily achievable. All right. Um, so if, if, you, if you'd like to, if you've got different dogs, say that you know one dog suits the thirty by thirty stuff and one suits the eighty by eighty. You know, again, you can enter that. It's, there's no restrictions on that. But you know, it's down to down to the people if they just want to see it. The other thing we've offered, um, which we haven't mentioned so far, is that well, we, we didn't really think about it, that people just said to us, what if we just want to buy the course maps and not compete? So we hadn't even included that in our sort of goal setting and, uh, and the plan. So actually, if anyone just wants to buy the course maps, um, but you know, for example, some Canadians were messaging and saying, I'd love to do this, but currently we're under three foot of snow, so we can't oh, do it, but, yeah. but, but can we buy the course maps? So. We've um, we've put it out there as well that you can you can just purchase the course maps um, and because really we hadn't thought anything of that we hadn't planned for that we thought as well we could try and do some good and we're going to donate fifty percent of that income to UNICEF so UNICEF USA so that hopefully we can actually give something back and each week on just some of these course plans we're going to going to pick a different charity that's um, working around the, the virus so I mean we might pick the same charity each week but um, it was just a it only happened sort of two days ago. Someone asked, "Can they do it?" And we're like, "Yeah, let's do that. Let's give those course plans out to people, um, and let's try and give something back to try and resolve the crisis as well." So, hopefully, we can pick a different charity each week that will will help people that are in situation with the virus that aren't as fortunate as us that are worrying about dog agility, which really isn't that important in the current situation, is it? So, you know, you look at the, the people that are suffering with the virus, but also some of the countries that are suffering, like Syria, and that if the virus hits there. You know what their concerns are compared to did I get a clear round today? Is um it makes it pretty trivial the agility. So hopefully we can actually give some give some back with that as well. So anyone that's interested in just purchasing those course maps, you know, it's it's not really for us. That's for hopefully for some charity donations as well. Yeah, UNICEF's a great organization. Been around a little yeah, after absolutely. World War Two. That's when they, it came out, and it's, it was to help um, uh, children living in this yeah. post World War Two world all around the world. Um, based in New York, um, so certainly uh, a great organization. And you know, a lot of people are going to be looking at this trial, this first trial, and see how it goes, and and just see the the work that you guys are doing. Obviously, you know, you'll be responding to feedback and changing things and, and adjusting and all of that. But um, you know, people have tried some online stuff in the past, and it's not too widely used. Uh, certainly, we've had students where it, it was uh, appropriate or they were interested in doing it, we always encourage them to do that. Um, so other organizations have certainly tried and, and have um, various programs of their own, but I think a lot of people are gonna be watching. I, I would say that UKI is probably the, the biggest, most high profile organization that has these big international events as an endpoint, you know, here WAO essentially, and is now doing mm -hmm. this. And so, you know, you know, Greg, if you're wildly successful, and I don't, I don't necessarily <laughs> financially, I, I, I don't see how that's going like to be popularity. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. if this is something that is really helpful to people and people are interested in their doing it, you know, it won't be long before other organizations start uh, putting out similar programs. So yeah. but in that case, you also still win because I think um, anyone who talks with you really does get that sense of um, uh, stewardship of the sport. Right. And so I think here on our podcast, you know, we're very, very concerned about that. 
you know, we have what people call now a, a growth mindset. We bring in all kinds of people, even if they, you know, even if they have online teaching or they're competitors who compete against us, you know, we're all kind of in the same sport. We mm-hmm. want to grow the sport. We want to enjoy the sport. Yeah. We want to be a community, be a family. And, um, if this really works, if this takes off, if this is helpful, if this is something that continues to exist, even when the viral danger is passed. I was going to put that idea out right? there. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it, it continues to exist because you're always going to have, you know, the bar knocker, reactive, fearful mm-hmm. type dogs. They're, they're always going to be there, you know, and, and these programs exist, you know, you will have um, advanced the sport, you know, that will be part of that, uh, the UKI um, legacy. legacy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess uh, I mean, we, we haven't really thought that far ahead, but if it's, uh, if it's something that people are interested in um, and it works and we can, I mean, our initial idea is to post your videos on a Facebook group and we judge them that way, but there must be, I'm sure as we get more into this, there's probably better ideas coming through about how we can run this properly. And maybe over the next few weeks we, we, we do that. Um, certainly like I said, we've talked with four legged flicks and, he's got a different idea about how people get the videos to us anyway. So um, we're, we're, we're open to feedback on that kind of thing. And, and yes, definitely there's, you know, there, there may be people that have got those dogs we spoke about that this is how they want to compete. Or you might have people that just, you know, they still want to travel to the qualifiers. To get, I was just about to say, yeah, I can't travel. Yeah. And, yeah. They got, they got kids, they got young kids or, or commitments where they, they can't, they can't get to the shows and, we could therefore, you know, they, but they still might want to, you know, once a year go to the US Open, for example. Well, this might be a way that we can provide service that gets them to qualify in, in a d- different way um, that we can work on that we feel is fair and, um, and it, it gives them that, that opportunity as well. So there's, there's, there's tons of potential with it that we've, yeah. you know, the last, the last four days, it's, it's kind of been like, you know, getting it done and getting it ready. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're always open to feedback, you know, I mean, I think hopefully that's something that UK gives across that we want our competitors to feed back to us. Sometimes not quite as negatively they have been. But, um, <laughs> positive, positive criticism and good ideas is, is, is helpful. And, you know, we, we, we're trying to provide agility that people want, um, you know, and it, we're not going to cater for everybody, obviously. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we listen to feedback and if it's given in the right way it can help us develop these kind of things and change this idea and maybe it's a long-term program we can look at awesome uh, there's yeah, we, one we get, sorry go ahead god i would say we, we gotta get we gotta get through the first few weeks yeah you know, yeah you know what it reminds me okay <laughs> it, over first. <laughs> it reminds me when i was pregnant with my first kid right uh-huh. first pregnancy ever and i was about uh it was it ended up being about three days before I went into labor. I didn't know that at the time because I was pregnant. You don't know exactly when you're going to go into labor. It was literally three days before my son was born. I'm huge, pregnant, and somebody asked me, um, so have y'all thought about a second kid? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and that, I was like, can I get this one out of me first, please? It's my first pregnancy. I don't, I don't know how delivery is going to go. Yeah. I don't know about having, how having a baby is going to be. Like I'm, like I'm all stressed out and I am not thinking about child number two at right now. So uh, similar situation. Greg right now is nine months pregnant. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Away from having his, uh, his UKI at home baby. Let's let him have it. Oh, no, that means I'm the person who asked about the second baby. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Okay, the one last thing I want to clarify before people, and then we'll wrap up. um, Okay. uh, So now that uh, geography um, matters not at all for UKI at home, um, can can literally anybody register with UKI? You mean around the world? Around the world, yeah. Like, are there any... Right. Are there any restrictions or like, I, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not f- familiar with how becoming a, uh, registering a handler and a dog works in UKI. Um, I guess theoretically they can, however, they're, so we've got guys doing agility at home in Singapore. A um, couple of them have, have, have signed up so they'll get their points towards the progression in Singapore. So I guess if there isn't UKI in your country, um, you're welcome to come and do the trials, I guess. Obviously, you won't get progression points because there is no UKI in your country. Obviously, if you want to start UKI in your country, give us a shout, but maybe not this week. Um, <laughs> give, us a, give us a couple of weeks to get through to that. But yeah, I, I guess anyone can, can, can is, is welcome to, to join up. And um, 
and do the agility at home. Obviously, just the progression and the points to the US Open wouldn't, wouldn't count. Um, well, all Canadian Open, the the, um, the 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 trials at home, the 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 buys for the Open are for you, Canada or USA, whichever country you live in. Um, Singapore doesn't have an Open, so they just get progression. Okay, um, got it. So I guess um, the reason for um, doing it would be that you would have access to the group and you get to see everybody else doing it. Like that would be the added benefit you would get over just buying the maps. Yeah, I, 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 I guess if you if you just you know this first week, it's everyone's going to post on. So uh, depending on which try you've entered, if you entered thirty thirty, you'll be accepted into a Facebook group that's for thirty thirty, and everyone's going to post their their. Um, specific classes on a specific post that's how we're initially getting up and running next week it could be that whoever you are you're you live streamed so you know it's going to be go on out on four-legged flicks um and whoever you are in the world if you've done it you can um you can enter and your video can be do at the moment we're talking about clear rounds only being live streamed it depends on the the number and obviously chris has got to get him and his guys to actually manage that number of runs so that, that number will develop as well. But it could, it could be a point where every single run is live streamed if you want to submit it to, 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 to the system, um, it, whether you got eliminated 25 times on the course or just knocked a bar or went clear. It, it might be streamed, but that's to be decided. But yeah. yeah you're like um, paying for the pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know? yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, you know, so some, of these, some of these courses, I think people are going to be pretty proud of their runs, even if they have five faults. You know, they knock a bar down and they might still be thinking, wow, I did a really good run. So, you know, but, you know, people might want to show those runs off as well. Um, you know, like I said that it's not just going around in a circle and, and a simple speed circle course, these courses. They, they're going to be showing your skills. Um, so I think people will be proud of their runs, even though they've knocked a bar down. Um, so it, it could be that they want them to be shown as well, just to show that they're part of the community, joining in the community, community you know, people like to be included, um, especially at this time where they might be isolated and sitting in a house on their own or just two of them. Uh, they might want to be feel like they're part of the community. So even if they've, they've not had a great run, they might want to have it streamed to show that they're they're, they're inclusive. Um, you know, we're, we're we're really not sure where people's people what they're feeling at the moment, what they want. So um, that's all to be discussed over the next few days and and try and kick something out for the the, the idea is we can basically run a try every week. Um, that's our current plan. Um, if that materialises or not, it's a different matter. But that's our current plan. So um, we, we you know just everybody basically keep up to date read the premium as you said is a massively important point uh, if people read the premiums our life would be a lot easier at the moment on <laughs> <laughs> um, reading premiums would be a would be just a really good point for everybody to and read the posts properly um you know when we post stuff try and read all of it try and make sure you've you've read it you thought about what we've said before you you sort of ask questions what we've already answered straight above you um, that that could also help uh, probably not just us, everybody in this situation, I'm sure multiple <laughs> right. companies are, are suffering with being bombarded with questions that we've already yeah. answered. So, um, That's you know, good life advice. Yeah. <laughs> Read yeah, the yeah, manual. Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm sure it's it's not just UKI that's, that's struggling. I'm sure our problems are pretty insignificant compared to what some people are going through with people not reading the advice that they should be doing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, reading advice, reading it properly, comprehending it, understanding it, and then thinking actually do I have a valid question would be cool uh, definitely um, my guys could then get some more work done rather than answering sort of uh, stuff that's already been answered if that makes sense but the right. way, UK, UKI is pretty insignificant when it comes to that compared to some things going on Right, right. So uh, just um, for those listening, I just want to let you all know that the uh, this first trial, the one that's uh, that is available now, uh, entries open March 28th. So that was uh, yesterday, yesterday as of our taping day um, and closes April 2nd. And then you can submit your runs from April 3rd to April 9th. As Greg said, for the first week, that's going to be uh, in this Facebook group. And uh, I know we talked about possibilities for the future, but I don't want people to get confused. So for the first week, it is clean runs only, correct? Yes, clear runs only this first week because we've we've there's um we've got four guys you know on, on the staff that are going to be judging, um, so they're they're sitting ready um, and again we don't know how many we're going to be judging. We don't know whether we're going to be inundated or we're going to be you know sitting there doing nothing. But um, yeah, currently just clear rounds only. Um, All right. And there's a few guidelines on what that means. You know, refusals are being judged, but only refusals that are run bys or refusals where the, for example, the double score on the A-frame gets back off. Those will be judged 
but refusals such as hesitations or deviations before the obstacle they're not being judged on this um yes that's too just it's too difficult to judge on a video especially if it's a set camera in one corner of the arena trying to watch across um you know our consistency couldn't be there so um there's a few slight differences like that but pretty much yeah if we want people to actually say yeah i think this is clear and then post it and then one of us will check it um and we'll post underneath yes this was definitely clear or no five faults missed a frame or five faults you know knocked a pole down but hopefully people are gonna gonna not be submitting those if they're that obvious anyway but um that that's that's week one plan that's all i say is week one that's what we're doing week two um stay posted hopefully we're we can come up with some slight improvements and maybe some changes. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, today, Greg, so we could um, clarify some of the rules, uh, let people know the thinking behind this, and uh, really that behind-the-scenes look at everything that's going into this idea of at-home agility by video. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, to, to come on and, and give our point of view. And and, um, and again, I hope everybody who's listening stay safe and, and careful in the situation and, and doesn't put themselves at risk by doing anything they shouldn't do. And uh, and important to observe themselves, their family and their dogs during this difficult time. Absolutely. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors, hitaboard.com and onetdc.com. Happy training. What do you call a pig that does cry? A pork chop.